Benedict Cumberbatch Actor Benedict Timothy Carlton Cumberbatch CBE is an English actor known for his work on screen and stage. He has received various accolades, including a BAFTA TV award, a Primetime Emmy Award and a Laurence Olivier Award, in addition to nominations for two Academy Awards and four Golden Globes. Born July the 19th, 1976, age 48 years, Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea Hospital, London, United Kingdom. Spouse, Sophie Hunter, M. 2015. Height, 1.83 M. Parents, Timothy Carlton, Wanda Ventham. Children, 3. Siblings, Tracy Peacock. Benedict Timothy Carlton Cumberbatch was born and raised in London, England. His parents, Wanda Ventham and Timothy Carlton, born Timothy Carlton Condon Cumberbatch, are both actors. He is a grandson of submarine commander Henry Carlton Cumberbatch and a great-grandson of diplomat Henry Arnold Cumberbatch CMG. Cumberbatch attended Brambledy School and Harrow School. Whilst at Harrow, he had an art scholarship and painted large oil canvases. It's also where he began acting. After he finished school, he took a year off to volunteer as an English teacher in a Tibetan monastery in Darjeeling, India. On his return, he studied drama at Manchester University. He continued his training as an actor at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, graduating with an MA in classical acting. By the time he had completed his studies, he already had an agent. Cumberbatch has worked in theater, television, film and radio. His breakthrough on the big screen came in 2004, when he portrayed Stephen Hawking in the television movie Hawking, 2004. In 2010, he became a household name as Sherlock Holmes on the British television series Sherlock, 2010. In 2011, he appeared in two Oscar-nominated films War Horse, 2011, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, 2011. He followed this with acclaimed roles in the science fiction film Star Trek Into Darkness, 2013, the Oscar-winning drama Twelve Years a Slave, 2013, The Fifth Estate, 2013, and August, Osage County, 2013. In 2014, he portrayed Alan Turing in The Imitation Game, 2014, which earned him a Golden Globe, Screen Actors Guild Award. British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor in a Leading Role. Cumberbatch was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE, by Queen Elizabeth II in the 2015 Birthday Honours for his services to the performing arts and to charity. Cumberbatch's engagement to theatre and opera director Sophie Hunter, whom he has known for 17 years, was announced in the forthcoming Marriages section of the Times newspaper on November 5, 2014. On February 14, 2015, the couple married at the 12th Century Church of St. Peter and St. Paul on the Isle of Wight, followed by a reception at Modestone Manor. They have three sons, Christopher Carlton, born 2015, Hal Auden, born 2017, and Finn, born 2019. Family Spouse Sophie Hunter, February 14, 2015, present, three children children. Christopher Carlton Cumberbatch. Hal Auden Cumberbatch. Finn Cumberbatch. Parents. Wanda Ventham. Timothy Carlton. Relatives. Henry Carlton Cumberbatch, grandparent. Tracy Peacock, half-sibling. Tracy Bennett, half-sibling. Trademarks. Deep bass baritone voice. Trivia. His parents Timothy Carlton and Wanda Ventham also played his character's parents on Sherlock, 2010. His character Sherlock Holmes' warm relationship with Mrs. Hudson is influenced by Cumberbatch's own real-life relationship with Una Stubbs, as she is good friends with his mother and she has seen him grow up. Has central heterochromia as well as sectoral heterochromia, the groovy but harmless genetic mutation that his friend James McAvoy describes in X-Men, First Class, 2011. Central heterochromia is where each eye has multiple colors in his case, each has a different but nearly identical combination of blue, green, and gold. Sectoral heterochromia is where one eye has a spot, or sector, of different coloration, his right eye has a brown freckle of color that, while small, 
is typical of sectoral heterochromia. His voice has been creatively described by journalist Caitlin Moran as a jaguar hiding in a cello. According to a film critic, his voice is so sepulchrally resonant that it could have been synthesized from the combined timbers of Ian McKellen, Patrick Stewart, and Alan Rickman holding an elocution contest down a well. The Jaguar hiding in a cello comparison apparently also clicked with the creative people at Jaguar Land Rover Automotive PLC. Cumberbatch voiced several commercials for Jaguar cars. Lost a notable amount of weight for his role as Sherlock Holmes, his goal being to portray Holmes as a character with such high intelligence that it manifests itself in a physical, mind-over-matter sort of way. During his gap year, before studying drama in Manchester University, he spent some time volunteering as an English teacher at a Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Darjeeling, India. The pupils were mostly Tibetans. Known for donating his own drawings and sketches for charities and fundraisers. Famous for his Alan Rickman impressions. He always wanted to pursue acting, however he entertained the idea of a law degree because of how hard his parents worked to give him an education. When he discovered that law was just as competitive, he decided to go with his passion. In 2013, he was ranked fifth place in the most fascinating people in Britain list of Tatler magazine, ranking higher than the Duchess of Cambridge and just below Queen Elizabeth II. He experienced a terrifying carjacking in South Africa while filming To the Ends of the Earth, 2005. He wrote about the experience in an article for the Prince's Trust, for which he is ambassador. His great-grandfather, Henry Arnold Cumberbatch, was Queen Victoria's Consul General in Turkey and Lebanon, and was a member of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for his services to foreign and commonwealth affairs. Is a huge fan of Robert Downey Jr., with whom he shares the iconic role of Sherlock Holmes. Fond of extreme sports like skydiving, hot air ballooning, scuba diving, and snowboarding. He unexpectedly got dual voice roles on The Simpsons, 1989, when he visited 20th Century Fox's studio for a completely unrelated appointment. He voiced the United Kingdom's Prime Minister, patterned from Hugh Grant's character in Love Actually, 2003, and did an Alan Rickman impression to voice Snape for the special Valentine episode that aired February 2013. For out of five films in which he appeared in 2013 received Academy Award nominations, 12 Years a Slave, 2013, Star Trek Into Darkness, 2013, August, Osage County, 2013, and The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog, 2013. His female fans were originally known as Cumberbitches, but are now known as the Cumber Collective or Cumber People. Cumberbatch is uncomfortable with the term Cumberbitches because he says it's non-inclusive and pejorative. His grandfather, Henry Carlton Cumberbatch, was a decorated submarine officer of both world wars and a prominent figure of London high society. One of his first ever acting roles was playing Titania, Queen of the Fairies in Shakespeare's comedy A Midsummer Night's Dream when he was age 13. In an interview, Dame Julie Andrews named Cumberbatch as one of the actors she is fond of. Good friends with Kira Knightley, Alice Eve, Martin Freeman, James McAvoy, Tom Hardy, Matthew Good, Zachary Quinto, and Tom Hiddleston. Friends with Chiwetel Ejiofor. Cumberbatch and Alan Turing, who he portrays in The Imitation Game, 2014, are actually related in real life. According to the family history site Ancestry, the two are 17th cousins, with family relations dating back to the 14th century. Both are said to be related to John Beaufort, the first Earl of Somerset, through Cumberbatch and Turing's respective paternal lines. Attended Harrow, one of the oldest, most respected, and expensive all-male boarding schools in the United Kingdom. Painted oil canvases and was a member of the rugby team while he was studying at Harrow. In 2012, he won a Laurence Olivier Award, London Evening Standard Award, and Critics Circle Award for his performance in Danny Boyle's stage production National Theatre Live, Frankenstein, 2011 at the Royal National Theatre wherein he played Victor Frankenstein and his creature in Alternating Nights. Benedict's favorite filmmakers are Stanley Kubrick, Michael Winterbottom, Steven Soderbergh, John Hughes, and Sir Alfred Hitchcock. Ranked number one in Empire Magazine's 100 Sexiest Movie Stars in 2013. Quotes On Stephen Hawking, he's such a presence, and you have to really know what you want to say to him or ask him because it takes such a huge, 
phenomenal effort for him to communicate with you. You think, I really don't want to waste this man's time. I was myself, rather than thinking, I'm a stupid actor, how on earth can I impress someone like this? I don't know what to say to make me feel worthy of playing this man. Cumberbatch, it sounds like a fart in a bath, doesn't it? What a fluffy old name. I can never say it on a Monday morning. When I became an actor, Mom wasn't keen on me keeping it. I am very flattered. I have also become a verb as in I have cumberbatched the UK audience apparently. Who knows, by the end of the year I might become a swear word too. It's crazy and fun and very flattering. It's the standard actor's joke, what are you doing after this? Oh, if Spielberg doesn't call, then I'm going to go on holiday. But a week after I'd said that, I got the call to say I had the job. It's one of those moments you never forget, I just fell off my chair. Which is not a good start to the horse riding. On being invited by Madonna to her London home to discuss playing Duke of Windsor, aka Edward VIII, in W.E., 2011, I'd whizzed round on my bike and thought we were going to have a read-through and a chat, but she wanted a full-on dress rehearsal. So I ended up in a suit and tie with Madonna operating the camera herself. On initially using his father's stage name, Carlton, when I started, I just assumed I couldn't be called Benedict Cumberbatch. But then, one day, I told someone in the business what I was really called, and they said, that's great, that's something you can use to stand out. On his Sherlock, 2010, series, it's a rare challenge, both for the audience and an actor, to take part in something with this level of intelligence and wit. You have to really enjoy it. It's a form of mental and physical gymnastics. I've been very lucky at what's happened in my career to date, but playing something as far from me as possible is an ambition of mine anything from a mutated baddie in a comic book action thriller, to a detective. If anything, I'd like Gary Oldman's career, he's the perfect example of it. I've loved to have a really broad sweep of characters, to be able to do something edgy, surprising, and unfashionable. May 2005 On Martin Freeman playing Bilbo Baggins, it was great. I got to hang out with him, and I kept a straight face for a bit and then I started giggling because I know Martin, I don't know Bilbo. For Martin to be sitting there playing Bilbo is amazing. He's going to be amazing, he's going to be fantastic in this film. On Sherlock, 2010, fan fiction, I suppose my bodily proportions are quite flattering. I'm ripped, doing something I wouldn't normally do with my body, or having done to it, involving Watson. So that's as far as I'll hit about that one, but it's all there on the web if you want to find it. I was amazed at the level of artistry, people have spent hours doing it. And there's some really weird cross-breeding stuff that goes on. The news got out that I was playing Smog and Hobbit and suddenly there were lots of dragons with purple scarves flying around so it's crazy, it's crazy. On declining to reprise his much-acclaimed role in After the Dance on Broadway, I've never really made a head-over-heart decision like that before, but there's a bit of momentum and I'd like to keep myself available for films. September 2011 I've seen and swam and climbed and lived and driven and filmed. Should it all end tomorrow, I can definitely say there would be no regrets. I am very lucky, and I know it. I really have lived 5,000 times over. May 2013 On his role in Star Trek Into Darkness, 2013, I don't really believe in good and evil, I don't really believe in heroes and villains. His reasons for what he does are quite profoundly persuasive. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and the fact that he's a shadow self of Kirk, same coin, different sides, is what makes him interesting to play. His advice from co-star Meryl Streep I asked her how she approached the multiple layers of her part. And she said, I don't know. I don't have a process. It changes with every job, doesn't it? And I thought, oh, thank God, to hear her say it. This whole thing about technique or method, it's bullshit. People say, oh, you're so precise. But within that, I work very hard to give every part a heartbeat. I learned a lot from just watching Meryl in repose. It was a bit like a Sherlock deduction actually. His would-be response to Julian Assange about movie portrayal of him, well, somebody is going to do it, wouldn't you rather it's someone who has your ear, who could steer the film to a place that's more accurate or balanced? 
the tabloid image of him, what he fears is going to be promoted, that weird, white-haired guy wanted for rape is so far from what we did. On his Hobbit character, it was publicized that I voice smog, and I thought, fucking hell. My voice, my motions, I worked my arse off to create that dragon. I can tell you I'm a huge fan of Downton Abbey, 2010, and what I said was quite, quite clearly, to most intelligent New York Times readers a joke. On the comments he made about Downton Abbey, 2010, on the New York Times. Sometimes as an actor you're looking for the infinite. If you can hold that, if you can remember that in the chaos, it will anchor you and give you grace and ease. Worst thing about my profession? The press, obviously. Don't write that, eh? On Downton Abbey, 2010, interviewed on Reader's Digest, August 16, 2012, we're remembering that there was a world before the First World War. We're living in a culture now that's revering, or having a nostalgia trip with, the beginning of the 1900s. Although Downton traded a lot on the sentiment in the last series. But we won't talk about that series because it was, in my opinion, f asterisk 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 ing atrocious. On being abducted in South Africa in 2005, it taught me that you come into this world as you leave it, on your own. It's made me want to live a life slightly less ordinary, I don't live beyond my means. I enjoy luxury and I enjoy the privilege of it, when I can afford it, and I'm in the situation where it's been given to me, but I'm very conscious of what is wasteful. I've always had an eye on longevity, I've got loads more goals to achieve. It's not like I've completely conquered the whole thing. That's a lifetime's objective, not an overnight thing. On delivering a successful performance, it's rather like a sportsman, where you hit a sweet spot and think, oh, that felt good. You don't necessarily know why it is. It's pretty fleeting, and I guess that's how it should be, because the minute you try to hold on to it, it's too precious, and you start to try to reinvigorate the ghost of what you've done rather than keep evolving it. Every time I'm seen at a bar with a girl, I get photographed. Anyone who has a computer knows my entire dating history. I get it. Paparazzi is an inescapable, immovable obstacle. The rule of law is being overrun so fast, eroding our civil liberties in a way that fundamentalists could possibly cherish. Yet there is a very real threat, for the other liberty that we could have taken away is our life, at any point, through the act of terrorism. I think intelligence services have really struggled post-Iraq with credibility, and I feel for them to a certain degree. They are trying to protect our right to exist. I've never been an activist, but I've always been politically aware. I protested against budget cuts and cuts to education. I marched against the Iraq War. All that protesting was just swept aside to pave the way for an illegal war, and the results of that war were made very, very plain by those leaked war logs. On The Hobbit, growing up, my dad read it to me, and it was a real treat, a feast for a child's imagination. He did an amazing smog, and Hobbits, and Gandalf as well, it's the audiobook that will never exist. The only thing that may unite all forms of acting in a sense is no matter what preparation you do, no matter what transformative process you go through, you are always yourself. You are always inside your own skin, you are who you are, no matter what the actions of the movement or the effect. You have to have an essential element of you, and that is also what is in the present. Once you're in the present and you're not worried about the wig, or the special effects suit, or the dialogue, or the accent, or the moral responsibility, when you are lost in the moment and you're in the present is when the stuff that's really good comes on screen. Until that point, you put in a lot of hard work to then let go, and all of us experience moments, and they're rare in every job I find, where you feel free of any kind of self-consciousness. On Alan Turing's royal pardon, the only person that should be pardoning anybody is him. Hopefully, the film will bring to the fore what an extraordinary human being he was and how appalling his treatment by the government was. It's a really shameful, disgraceful part of our history. Hollywood-style stardom was never my goal, yet it seems to be happening due to particular projects. I don't seek. I don't avoid. I just follow my path, doing my best. On his look, it's the blessing of having a weird face somewhere between an otter and something people find vaguely attractive. On fame, you can't imagine fame. 
you can only ever see it from an outsider and comment on it with the rueful wisdom of a non-participant. When it happens to you, it doesn't matter what age or how, it is a very steep learning curve. The important thing to realize in all of it is that life is short, to protect the ones you love, and not expose yourself to too much abuse or narcissistic reflection gazing and move on. If fame affords me the type of ability to do the kind of work I'm being offered, who am I to complain about the downsides? It's all relative. And this are obviously very high-class problems. The way privacy becomes in every shrinking island is inevitable, but also manageable, and it doesn't necessarily have to get that way. On the imitation game, 2014, often, as an actor, you draw on your own experience or memories, but I really didn't have to hear. Touring, got under my skin. It was just so pitiful. Imagining the physical weakness, the vulnerability, the exhaustion, how the hormones affected his emotional state. It was all ungovernable. What matters to me is the quality and the variety of the work. I'm in it for the long game. I'm interested in working in 40 years' time and turning round and talking to an actor on set and telling them stories about working with Judy Dench and Michael Gambon. So any talk of man of the moment, hype, heat, whatever, I just smile wryly. It's the same shit with sexiest whatever, I was around 10 years before that as an actor, and no one took the same face seriously. It's all projection. People say, this is your moment. Well, I hate to say it, but I don't believe in moments. I don't believe in one-offs. I believe in something continuing and continuing, and I want to be doing this job for the next 50 years if I live that long. Salaries. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, 2022, $7,500,000, plus box office bonus. Doctor Strange, 2016, $5,500,000.